When I was given the opportunity to give a TED talk, I took it in an instant. But when I sat down to think of a topic or my idea worth spreading, I found myself lost because I noticed that most people who give these TED talks are either A, experts in a particular field, or B, people who have had a unique experience that is worth sharing with other people. And I'm 15, the only thing I'm an expert at is panicking about my distant future and I'm not even that good at it and most of my experiences are lost to the oblivion that is my childhood. But then I realized, wait, there is something unique about me. I have a manager. Oh. I know, shocking. My manager is this over-the-top, ever-present being in my day-to-day -day life and I really do mean that. She never leaves me alone. But for some reason, I always trusted her and the reason was mainly due to the way our relationship started. It all began when one day I got home from school with my report card in hand and I sat down not really thinking much of it. But my manager said, B stars, Amanda, you are an A star student. And I heard that and I thought, that's right, I can do better than this. I was filled with a determination to work harder, achieve more and it was good. But then I started to ignore my extracurricular activities, you know, going for competitions and debates and whatnot. So my manager said, Amanda, grades are not everything, you know that. And at that point, yes, my manager was right. And this made sense back then, but it also still makes sense today. So I heeded her advice and I started balancing it out. And it worked. At this point, my manager was less of a manager and more of a friend. But then the trouble really began when my manager started to prey on my relationships. And I know at this point my manager probably sounds like one of your ex-partners who has always told you that your friendships are not toxic. But unlike that situation, my manager didn't say that other people were the problem. My manager said that I was the problem. That I needed to be the perfect student, the perfect daughter, the perfect friend, the perfect sister. Okay, not the perfect sister. but. I hated that and I started to change details about the way I behaved, the way I interacted with people, smiling at everyone whenever I could, being nice and polite, making my posture perfect and the way I talked to them fluent. But what really drove me on, on over the edge was when my manager said, Amanda, you need to be a better person. You need to change some details of your personality. And I hate to say it, but I listened. Today, I'm still trying to get rid of my manager, I'm still trying to fire her. But some of you might be wondering, who is this manager? Well, I'm sorry if I misleaded you, but my manager is not a person. My manager is a mindset. And my manager's name is Perfectionism. Which in retrospect, I realize is also the name of this TED talk. This was a bad idea. But the word perfectionist, we hear it thrown around every now and then in our day to day lives, whether we're the ones throwing it around or it's other people doing so. You know, like, I need all the lines in my notebook to be perfectly parallel to the edge of the paper. I know, but I'm a bit of a perfectionist. Or, I cannot go to sleep unless the pillows on my bed are perfectly lined up and my head is right at the center. It's a little bit over the top, but I'm a bit of a perfectionist. Or, in some cases, I refuse, I refuse to play this childish game of real estate unless the fives and the ones of my monopoly bank are perfectly separated from each other. I'm sorry, Cousin Barbara, but I'm a bit of a perfectionist. Well, I'm here to tell you a few things that maybe we all understood about perfectionism, but that may not be exactly how it feels. The first thing being that perfectionism is not just about needing to have Can I cut this part? Number one, a lot of people think that perfectionists are just people who have high standards and want to achieve the goals that they set. And this isn't necessarily untrue. But perfectionism is a need to be flawless. It's not about what we achieve, but it's about the mistakes that we make that taints what we've achieved. And that creates this mindset for us where we look at the wrong things. Number two is that we tend to set up ideals for ourselves. And this, and this stemmed from this idea that perfectionism is about dissatisfaction. 
But it's not just about dissatisfaction, it's also about fear. Most of the times it's about the fear of failure, but for different people it can vary. For myself, it's the fear of the distant future. Last night I spent one hour looking at university admission requirements and comparing them to my own credentials instead of revising this TED talk, which I, assu which I assume is probably evident at this point. But the reason I do these things, the reason I try so hard, is because I'm scared of what I'll be like in the future. And also because I set up this ideal, this image of what I want to look like 10, 20 years from now. And I'm constantly striving to be that person, even though that person cannot exist because she's perfect. So we tend to set up these ideals and strive for, for it every second of every day. That's our goal. But it becomes a problem because these goals are unattainable. Third of all, is that perfectionism is not just about achievement. It's about this idea that achievement of certain fields and the quality of our actions and the quality of our thoughts is what defines our self-worth and ultimately our happiness. And that's what really consumes us because we start to believe that we cannot be truly worth anything unless we are perfect in all of our achievements, not a single flaw. If we make a flaw or we make a mistake, there's a flaw, that could be the end of the world. Perfectionism is also not defined by a scale of one to 10. We don't look at a scale and think, how perfect am I? How close am I to receiving that goal? It's a yes or no question. Am I perfect or am I not? And if I'm not perfect, how can I change that? How can I shorten the distance and how can I change that disparity? Because it's black and white for us. And we're always, always in the black. But the real tragedy of perfectionism is not just this idea of self-worth and happiness. It's this constant driving force. It's this constant running. And it is this constant belief that if we can't reach our goals, then we are worth nothing. It's stemmed by all of our fear, all of our expectations, and it drives us to keep running all the time towards a goal. And what's really sad is that the definition of perfect in practice is the same as tan 90 degrees. It's not defined, not even by us perfectionists. We don't know what we're really striving towards. We don't have every detail set out. All we know is that whatever perfect could mean, whatever it may mean to me, to the world, to the people around me, to some other being, whatever it could be, that is what will finally define me. That's what will give me purpose. So I just keep running, aimlessly, knowing that I'm going somewhere, but I don't know where it is. I just look at that light at the end of the tunnel, like Jay Gatsby and Daisy Buchanan, just seeing that green light across the bay, letting everything else fall away and thinking that that's all I'll ever need. And even if there is a chance of that light being an illusion, the chances of being able to attain that, the chances, the probability of it is all consuming. And you think, if that's a possibility, then I want that. If that's a possibility, then maybe I'll be happy. Maybe Ultimately, perfectionism is not just a work ethic, it's not really even a lifestyle. It's a mindset, a toxic mindset, a virus that preys on you, that corrupts you and robs you of your identity and your self-worth. It tells you what you can and cannot be, but it is the only thing that can ultimately ruin you. And that is the only perfect definition for flawed there is.